Welcome back to the Plan Your Federal Retirement Podcast. I'm your co-host, Micah Shalansky, and with me is the legendary financial advisor, Floyd Shalansky. Pops, how you doing, sir? You know, I am so excited to be here with you today. Uh, and, you know, tomorrow we've got this great in-person thing going on. So uh, we haven't done that since, what, 2019? The Zoom is great, but I can't wait to be on stage presenting with you. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic, right? We're doing that live class, which is great for federal employees. Um, yeah, Zoom, webinars, all these things, man, I love technology when it works. Uh, but doing it in person, being able to interact with people, we got over 80 people signed up with our class. And so that is going to be great. But Pops, I know today, one of the things that we want to make sure that we were talking about, and of course, you didn't get the reference, by the way, Floyd Shalansky is my father. That's the reason I'm calling him dad uh, on the podcast as we go through this. And uh, Floyd started our firm back in the late 70s, and he comes to us with a wealth of experience, over 40 plus years of financial planning. And today's podcast, we really want to talk about the importance of building a financial plan. And so Pops, I wanted to have you on the podcast so we could go through and talk about this because you got even better stories than I do, but really about the importance of building the plan. And it's not about having a per, the super precise one, the super accurate, all these Monte Carlo and tables and all that. The more accurate you is, you try to make it, the more inaccurate it becomes, which is a whole different thing we could talk about. But it's really the starting motion, the taking action and doing something which makes such a big difference. Without a doubt. You know, there was that Harvard study years ago about setting goals, the graduating class, the ones that wrote their goals down, 80% succeeded, the others, they don't know where they're at. It's the exact same way, whether you're just getting started, 18, 22, 30 years old, mapping a strategy out. If you're 30 years old mapping a strategy, you and I know one thing, it's going to change. But with the strategy, right. you've got what you and I refer to as away points. We're always sailing, navigating towards these away points to be successful. Yeah, and that's really the importance, right? So I want to go through a couple of different things on, on the podcast today and really talking about mistakes, right? Everybody loves mistakes um, and they're great lessons, what to avoid, what things to be thinking about, but also not just the mistakes. How are we taking action? And Pops, I love what you say is creating those waypoints that's in there. And I think we need to look at them in different ways. And I really like ranges when we're also creating these because we don't know exactly what's going to happen and retirement isn't exactly pass fail. Well, I guess it could be if you run out of money before you die, that oh, was yeah. a fail. Um, so, yeah. so fair enough. But I really like ranges. Are we on the general track getting there? Because we can't control the markets. We can't control the economy. There's a lot of stuff we can't control. So what I want to focus on when we're working with clients, and I got this from you, is I want to focus on things people can do, actions we can take, things that are in our control that help get us on that path. Amen. You know, so many times we talk to young folks getting started, and I like to see that five-year option. So you develop five-year strategies, and about the second year, I call it up periscope, everything kind of like what I thought it was going to be, down periscope, let's keep sailing. Oh, wait a minute, there's a storm, i got to deviate. Maybe you weren't going to get married, and all of a sudden now you've got kids. That's a change in the plan. Yeah, and it's big of those life events that are the biggest changes in the plans, right? What we're not focused on, we don't plan on things to say, oh, if the market goes down and I'm still saving, what am I going to do? Great, buy more, right? Uh, we're thinking about bigger things in the picture. And one of the things you've heard us say on the podcast time and time and time again is cash flow is the heartbeat of retirement. And, and it really is. And I didn't first understand that really when I started being a financial planner. I know, Pops, you were like, no, it's the heartbeat, it's the heartbeat. So I just did these things, not really understanding why they're so important. But as I started working with more people, helping more people, now thousands of federal employees across the nation, it really, truly is heartbeat is the essence of retirement. So Pops, why is heartbeat so crucial for retirement? Well, excuse me, why is cash flow the heartbeat of retirement? Why is that so crucial in retirement? You know, I, I did a podcast just this the other day, and it was one by, I know, the Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine. They put out this list. How are you doing in comparison to someone else? Mm. And you go, interesting. So I've got this, you know, young professional making a million dollars a year, and I'm a young professional married with three kids. Is that the same thing? All right. So everyone is so different with that. We have to watch what they're doing. How do you spend your money? What what do you want to accomplish? You know, one guy said, Floyd, can I retire tomorrow? And I said, yeah, I don't know how long you can stay retired, but yeah, you can retire tomorrow. <laughs> so it becomes that cash flow, right? How much are you right. spending? And so many times we see people thinking that, well, let's see, my paycheck's X today. I'm spending less than X. So when I retire, I'm good. 
but the paycheck after retirement is X minus, and all of a sudden their cash flow remains the same. And if you're not tracking cash flow, you may be going bankrupt and you don't even know it yet. That is such a great point. We get so caught up in these statistics on the averages, right? What is the average right. person saying? What do you need to do? I know one of the questions our, our team put together actually came from the listeners is how much do you need to save, you know, for retirement? That's a great question, but that's such a depends question. It depends on you. So I'm all about that. Let's throw out the averages because they don't matter, right? What matters is are you on track for your, your retirement? retirement. Yeah, amen. Not, not, right. are, not are you on track for somebody else's retirement. That's irrelevant. And that's why cash flow is so important. So when we start looking at cash flow, and every time we meet with clients, and, and Pops, you're, you're great about this, we always start off talking about cash flow. And why are we looking at it? Number one, we want to track what we're spending. Do we have what I call financial awareness? Do we have an awareness of where our money's going? Now, if you don't know how much money a month you're spending, that's going to be an action item. Now, I don't want you to go create a budget with 72 different line items and track it to the penny, but I want my clients to know generally where is their money going every month in no more than five categories. So quickly, I would just do household, travel, entertainment, medical, and kids. Those are my big five categories where my money goes. I make everything kind of fit into those categories. Now, why do I like five? It seems like an easy, manageable number. And now what I have is general awareness of where my money's going. If I had a spreadsheet that had 172 different line items and I had to budget it, while the spreadsheet is probably accurate, I don't really know where my money goes. And I need to know, am I overspending or underspending, especially the years leading up to retirement, the year before and the year of retirement. This is where it can go south, right? So Pops, if someone retires and they're not tracking their cash flow, what happens to their spending the first year of retirement? Well, you know, I use a bell curve as an example. We know you're going to retire at X. And then what happens is that uh, there's honeydews, there's travel, all these other things you want to do. So we watch that expense go up somewhere. And I tell our, I, I always tell our pre-retirees somewhere in the 12th to 16th month, if your bell curve isn't trending down, I say, we have to come have a talk with come to Floyd talk because you're going to blow it. And one of the things that you and I do and the firm does so well is that we get people ready to retire. We take that extra and we put it away in a, a separate account. And why do we do that? So we get your retirement check coming to you as we anticipate. All right. And then we know the overspending. So I've got some place where I can pull the overspending back into it. And when it goes to zero, we better be back on track. Yeah, I'm a big fan of those separate accounts too. So whether it's we're saving money for travel, uh, it says, great, I want to pay X, I want to spend X amount a year in travel. Great. Well, here's a great thing that you should do, a kind of hack for retirement side, is we should open up a separate travel account and we should put X dollars a month inside of that travel account. And that's a spendable account. What does that mean? When you have the money in there, go ahead and spend it for travel. But if you don't have the money in there, you don't spend it for travel. One of the biggest mistakes that I see retirees get in the habit of when they're not tracking their cash flow is they think that they're in investments or an unlimited bank account. This is especially really challenging in up markets because what can happen is the markets are going up, your accounts are going up in value and you're pulling money out, but you're not seeing it go down in value. You're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I should have retired decades ago. I am never going to run out of money. No matter what I pull out, it just makes it right back up. Yeah, for that year. But what about like last year when the market was down 20%? That didn't happen. So understanding our cash flow and remembering that our bank accounts, our investment accounts, our TSP is not unlimited. Mike, it's like, you know, you're working and you take a holiday, right? And you got your budget and about halfway through the budget or halfway through the holiday, you go, ah, to hell with it. And you spend more than what you've got set aside because mentally I got a paycheck coming when I get back. I'll catch up. But what happens is, oh, I love this one. Oh, I can work some overtime and get it caught back up, right? Instead, you come back and then your payroll or your, your pension is flatlined. Maybe a two or three percent increase every year, but it's flatline. Where, how do we pay that credit card off? Now we got to tip into the TSP. Now we got to hit the IRA, and all of a sudden we start. Perhaps if it's like two thousand and eight, we're shrinking into principal versus just the earnings. Yes. So one of the things that can be different, right? A retiree could be looking at this pops, and they could say, "Well, look, my spending, my net income, what I'm spending today. Let's just say your next spend, your net income is seven thousand dollars a month, and you're going to plan on spending seven thousand a month in retirement, and you have the assets to do that, which is fantastic, seven grand, ten grand, whatever your number is, and you say, "Sweet, I have the income to do it. 
how is this any different? I'm already planning that I'm already spending $10,000 a month today and I'm going to spend $10,000 a month in retirement. Therefore, nothing is different. And that's kind of mentally where our mind goes. But here's one big thing that's different. Let me ask you this question, listeners. When do you spend more money? Monday through Friday when you're working or Saturday and Sunday on the weekends? Now, the second part of this question, what happens when every day is a weekend? Yeah, now we start seeing our spending really increase, don't we? Yeah, if they don't believe that, just have them go look at their credit card statement the last year and, and, and look at the months and see and, and plot the dates and see, oh my God, look, he's right. Yeah, now I can vacation more, I can travel more, I can do things. Now, sometimes I hear this, this is Michael, well, I won't need as much professional clothes, so I'm going to have more money. It's like, ah, all right, we're creatures of habit. What you're used to spending, you're going to continue to spend unless something changes. All right, the house is going to be paid off. Great. The house is going to be paid off. Does that mean your house payment goes away? No, you have taxes and insurance that are part of that payment, right? We got to remember these things. So cash flow planning, and again, all of these little pieces are part of cash flow planning. So cash flow is the heartbeat of retirement it is so important. And dad, that's one of the reasons we talk to our clients about if, if I have my ideal at least one year, ideally two, 12 to 24 months before retirement, we have everything set up as if you are retired. Sometimes we can really do that. Sometimes we have to pretend to do that and how it's set up. But I even like to go to the extreme of saying, you know what, I want to take 100% of your paycheck, have it deposited in an outside investment account. And then from that investment account, once a month, you're going to get your net monthly income. So now instead of getting paid every two weeks, you're going to get paid once a month. And you could be thinking, Micah, that's irrelevant. It's the same money, da, 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 da. Okay, well, that's theory. Let me tell you, in reality, going to once a month, it's a mindset shift for a lot of our clients. You know, Micah, that's so, so, so accurate. You know, uh, in, in, in your podcast listeners, I, I know they're aware of this, but they're, they're probably freaking out and going, wait a minute, I got five years till I retire. Well, what we really try to what we try to get you to do is five years out and say, OK, what's your pension plan going to be? We can accurate, you know, get within five to 10 percent of that. If you're retiring before 62, what's the first supplement going to be? How do we factor that into that? Mm -hmm. Now let's start seeing what the gap is. So now your income, which was at eight thousand, goes down to five. Now you got a three thousand dollar gap. First thing you may do when you see the money start to tighten up is you're going to make normal changes. A lot of times when we do budget work, there's a slippage. I can look at your gross income minus taxes, minus social security, minus your benefits, your net income, and we come up with a magic number. And that magic number historically is 10 to 15% more than what you think it is. So the first thing we do is we look at working down the gap, trying to find out what that is. Then it's a math question. How much do we need to build up in this account? So when you do retire and we have to fill this gap, we're able to do that. Back to the point where Micah was talking about, you know, once you pay the house off. Well, I bet a lot of you podcast listeners have refinanced your house and you're down at 3% or less on the interest rates. So if you take a look at your statement and look at what's going to principal and interest versus property tax and insurance, you may find out that the difference is less than $1,000. So that really affects your cash flow. It affects the heartbeat because now when you want to retire and travel and do those things, you want to feel good about it. You don't want to go and can I afford to do this. We never want to go to a client and say, you can't do that. You're going to go bankrupt. We, we never want to do that. We want you to spend the way you want to if we plan and we start with a long enough runway to make sure that when you take off to retirement, we have your parachute packed the way that you want to, to have an enjoyment golden years. I love it. And just because we don't want to have those conversations doesn't mean we won't, right? Part of our Amen. job is, is to call you out on it uh, in a, from a good place and saying, hey, let's be really clear on what our goals are. And Pomps, I know one of these things that comes up, <laughs> I always laugh at this one because we have good, good stories on this, is big expenses, right? Micah, how do I plan for un, unexpected big expenses that comes up? And I said, well, give me an example. I'm going to need a new car, right? Now, okay, great news is we recognize we're going to need a new car. The next step of that is recognizing after this new car, it will be another new car. Now, if you're not a new car person, a new to you car, whatever you call that, you're going to replace your vehicle. And where does that come from? And this is a cash flow question in my mind. And I say it time and time again, I want all of my retirees 
normally to have a car payment. Now, it could be going to a loan or a bank account, right? We can argue the difference between the two, but cash flow wise, I want you to be budgeting for the next vehicle because you're going to have that expense. And where retirees make, an, make a mistake, they get everything paid off. They get the house paid off. They get their retirement. They get their uh, cars paid off. They get their debts paid off. All of these things. Then they go into retirement, sailing and spending all of the extra money that they were using to pay off debt. Then they have to replace a vehicle. And now vehicles have gone up and now they're fifty, seventy five thousand dollars dollars for a vehicle. And they're like, holy moly, I wasn't expecting this. So they were so apt to pay it off, but they didn't set that money aside for the next expense. Oh, and we were talking before the podcast, Micah's grandfather, my my dad, um, we retired him from the Air Force, retired him from the Teamsters, and then he did some local things around his hometown, retired the third time, and he says, son, I'm buying my last new car. Four cars later, it was his last new <laughs> car, all right? And it's like a house. You know, uh, I'm going to build my dream house because this is it. I got to tell you, statistically, after you retire, you got three, three new homes or three additional homes and four moves. All right. Please prove us wrong. But for 42 yes. years, I can almost 98 percent guarantee that's not your last new house. It's not the last time. So many times our plans are when I retire, I'm going to go home. You can go back. But can you really go home? You've traveled the world, you've done all these exciting things, and maybe when you go home, it's not the same. So there's been so many things that we, we as planners, or your planner, or what Mike and I do with our, or with our clients, is we plot and plan, again, that five-year thing, up Periscope, getting closer, let's modify as things come up. Hey, Floyd, I wanna to go to Peace Corps for a year after I retire. Dynamite, we're gonna pickle a house or sell it. Huh, hadn't thought about what I'm gonna do with the house. It's something we gotta plot and plan inside there. Yeah, when something goes wrong at home, who do we have locally? Do we have a handyman uh, on standby? Right. Do we who's going to be able to take care of these things? These are things that we we've <clears throat> talked about with hundreds of clients. These are things that we need to be thinking about of how is this going to uh, affect us? And pops, I, I love that example of the home, right? Because most of our clients, when they retire, they're still in the big home, right? Then they want to move into their dream home, but that's not going to be the last home. Sometimes they'll move. I'm dealing with a client right now. They, they moved and they loved it and they loved it for about five, six years. And now it's just not the same. And even though, Micah, this is the home we're going to die in, we're now moving and changing states and they're looking at another home. Well, great news. We already had planned for that, um, but that's just one of those things. And I know that that home isn't their last home either. They're going to probably move again. And sometimes it's chasing grandkids, right? So again, this is the reason that when we say, hey, look, you try to be so precise in the plan, it becomes highly inaccurate. This is when we need to step back and look at ranges. Now, Pops, I remember when I was first, you know, getting into financial planning and you would tell me this, we got to use ranges and all these other things. And I'd be so frustrated. I'm like, no, I can build it out in Excel. We can model this thing. We can do it. But, but life is different. Right. So we got to create these tolerances. We got to create these ranges. And as long as we're in the side of this range in your financial plan, that's really good. Now, we spent the better part of 15 minutes just talking about one thing, which is cash flow into retirement. Um, and this is huge. Now, this is just one small element in building your financial plan and things you need to do. So before we move on a little bit to the next one, one other thing on cash flow, I mean, I could spend all day talking about this, but and it's the 50 50 rule. One of the things oh, that yeah. where people get in trouble when they're planning their retirement is they're planning it for five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out. And they say, great news. I'm spending here today. If you're watching me on YouTube, you can see my hands, right? We're spending at this level today and I'm saving at this higher level, which is fantastic. And then what happens is this lower level, your spending starts going up over time. You get pay raises. It hits your bank account. It starts going up, but you keep your savings at the same rate. And so now all the time that comes by, now all of a sudden my spending is exceeding my savings. I'm no longer on track to be able to be financially independent and retired. So one of the things we got to do to keep on top of that is a general 50-50 rule. Now, are there exceptions to this? Sure. But generally speaking, we love a 50-50 rule. Any new money, any unexpected income that you have coming in, whether it's a step increase, whether it's a pay raise, whether it's a cost of living adjustment, whether it's inheritance, any of those things, minimum we should be thinking about 50% goes to the future, 50% to the bottom line. It's okay to improve our lifestyle a little bit when we get pay raises as long as we're saving for the future. But if our spending and lifestyle outpaces our savings, it's going to be really hard to stay retired. 
You know, Mike, so, 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 so accurate, you know, in the, in the first book I wrote, Learn to Win the Money Game, you know, way back in, in the 80s, we, we started talking about these percentages. And those podcast listeners, YouTubers that are listening, if you have kids, imagine teaching your children how to use percentages oh, yeah. when they first go, start working. And every time, you know, they get a pay raise, they get it, you know, they go from 14 or eight dollars ten dollars now to 13 or 14 and get the real jobs now they're accustomed to spending at this level you give them new money and guess what they want to do they're going to improve your lifestyle take percentages put it away take percentages put it away it, not not that we want to be regressive but can you imagine when you first came in as a gs5 or gs8 or and you started working and you did the percentages over time and now you're getting ready to retire 20 years later what the percentages might be it might be huge. That's a game changer if we can convince people to do that early on. Yeah, it would be massive, massive improvements. All right. So another thing inside of this mix, right? It's not just about cash flow today, it's cash flow in the future. So we need to, you need to sit down and look at when you're building your financial plan is an honest assessment of number one, what am I spending today? Right. And that needs to be, yep, that's what I'm going to be spending in the future. There's a few exceptions to that. If we're thinking that we're, or you're shaking your head, no, you disagree? No, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so what we're spending now is probably what we're gonna be spending into retirement, right? Few exceptions to that role, but that's what I'd plan on. And then we need to have a very intentional assessment of saying, where's your income gonna come from in retirement? This is another big misconception that I see all the time pops, and I know you do as well, is what people think their income is gonna be is not actually what their income is. I'm gonna pick on the TSP. Now, I love the TSP, TSP is fantastic, right? But so often we look at the TSP and says, oh my gosh, I have 800,000 in there. I have a millionaire. I have how much in there? It's amazing, which it is. That is congratulations to you. That is fantastic. Then you look at this TSP statement and it says, hey, you could take a TSP annuity of $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month. You're like, hey, I got my pensions two or three grand a month. Then I got two or three grand a month coming in for my TSP annuity. Plus I'm going to have 2,000 in social security. Man, I am set. That's fantastic. I'm spending $8,000 a month today. That's $8,000 a month in the future. This is amazing. Well, if you listen to this podcast before, you really picked up on this, I'm sure. That was a difference, an example of gross versus net. You're comparing gross income, which is the total amount that would be coming out of the TSP, the total amount of your pension, to your net spending. So if I'm taking out $8,000 a month from my pension, from my TSP and Social Security, gross, that is not $8,000 net, which is hitting my bank account. That's less than six, potentially in the five, potentially less than five, depending on what your deductions are. So that's a big difference in these numbers. So we got to have an honest assessment of the gross income, but really what's our net retirement income going to look like? Mike, and that's a great segue into our retirees. So many times they stop doing tax planning. You know, I can remember back in 1981, 1980, the highest, highest marginal tax bracket in the country was 90 percent. All right. We had an election that got dropped to 50, went as low as down to 28 percent. You know, and at 28 percent, a lot of the conversation was defer, defer, defer. And all of a sudden now we're getting re re ready to retire in 2023, 24, 25. What have taxes done? They've creeped back up, haven't uh -huh. they? And then when you hit this thing called required minimum, I'm sorry, almost said required mandatory distributions again, required minimum distributions at age 72 or three or four, you're going to take out of that $2 million TSP, maybe a hundred thousand bucks or get penalized. Now what's that hundred thousand dollars going to do to your tax bracket? Ah, you know, so many times that we, we you know, when I retire, I'll be in a lower tax bracket. Well, the financial advisor's job is probably to keep you in the same, if not higher, making sure your assets are working adequately for you so you can get a pay raise in retirement. As inflation kicks up the cost, you can be you can draw a little bit more money out. Ooh, this is where I'm going to push back on you. Um, and so I agree with that. I'm going to take the one little change in that tax bracket comment. The financial advisor's job is to make sure cash flow is good in retirement and we're beating the IRS out of tens of thousands of dollars as a taxes in the long term. So it's not just about that tax bracket game, right? It's it's really about that cash flow game and saying, sweet, what can we do? And then you know this, it's not just taxes. One, a lot of our clients get killed in the Medicare bracket. Excuse me, <sighs> the clients that didn't do planning, right? And now we're at the later stage of that when they're seeing us in their yeah. lives is 
there's very little we can do to keep them under the Medicare bracket, and they're being bumped up in their Medicare premiums more. So tax planning is so essential, especially the younger we are. How much are we putting in Roths? How much are we putting in the Roth TSP, the Roth 401k? How much Roth conversions are we doing? Really looking at what our taxes will be in retirement under current law and saying, great, how do I beat that today? You know, I'm, I'm smiling, Micah. What's your least favorite uncle? Sam. <laughs> Sam, right? So what's your least favorite aunt? Irma. Aunt Iris. Yeah. Oh, no, Irma. Aunt Irma. Better. <laughs> yeah, because of Medicare, right? Because the more mm -hmm. you take out, then you get these adjustments and you hadn't planned on it. You know, now you turn 65 and your part A, of course, is free, not free. You paid for it all your life. You stop paying for, for it at 65. And then you start taking part B and you're keeping your income low. And then you sell a house, you sell a, a real estate transaction, you do something, all of a sudden, your Social Security, Medicare gets kicked up, and the maximum now is five hundred and thirty-four dollars a month. And did you plan for that? Maybe, Each. maybe not. Each, right? So it could be a th over a thousand dollars a month because you sold a, a piece of investment property, and you're tickled to death yep. because you made so much money, you paid your taxes on it. I'm really good, and then here comes. Ann Irma. Oh, by the way, we want to know that instead of one hundred and sixty nine dollars. Now we want five hundred dollars. That affects your, the heartbeat and the cash flow. Yeah, affects the cash flow. All right. So this podcast yeah. is all about action items, right? We love having fun. We love talking about finances uh, and have a good time at it. But Pops, it's really about what action items can our listeners take this week in order to make improvements in their financial plans. So I'll kick it off. I'll say the first one is you need to have an honest assessment. We talked about this on other pods, but I call it the financial awareness, financial cash flow conversation. Where does your money go? Gross on a monthly basis. How much do you spend? And then give me three to five categories, no more than five, where your money goes. And what are the ranges for that? That's super, super important. I would start on that this week. I agree to 100%, son. The next thing I look at is how much do you really need, and that's just write a tag along with you, how much do you really need in retirement? And you and I both know that they're going to spend what they're going to spend, whatever comes in. So structuring that, and I, I'd like to add to that, start five years out from retirement. Five years, start yes. working on getting down to what your pension will be, what your first supplement or Social Security will be. How can you do to get to, uh, to learn to live within those means? Uh, and like you said, try it before you retire. Make sure you sell off into retirement feeling comfortable you can do this. You know, that five years is so important, right? And it ties right into the next one, which is our last action item. What's your distribution plan? And I love that. You need to be setting this up five years in advance. Here's an easy example. What if you planned on retiring at the end of this year, but last year the market was down 20%? You lost 20% inside of your TSP account. Yeah, right? Now now it doesn't feel so good moving into retirement. So now it's the conversation, should I work another year? Should I wait till it recovered? Well, if we have foresight and we say, hey, what's the soonest I'm thinking about retiring? And let's create a distribution plan for that. Is it more conservative? Sure. Are you potentially leaving money on the table? That depends. What's the market going to do? Right now, if you know exactly what the market's going to do, then don't heed my advice and, and please go do that because you know more than me. But if you're not exactly sure what the market's going to do in the next couple of years, then we need a solid plan for distributions in a down market. In our class, the three critical concepts, we talk a lot about that. So I want to see what's your distribution plan. Make sure that flows into your cash flow. And that's going to be answering the question, are you on track for retirement or not? My, I'll go back to 2008, and, and as we talk like this, I can think of eight feds that didn't retire because their TSP or the 401ks became a 201k. I mean, such a dratical yeah. reduction that, you know, and, and I look at them and they were not FERS, they were SERS. I says, it doesn't make a difference. But mentally, watching the Emotional. TSP come down, their heart says, I can't do this right now. And we want yeah. to, we can't eliminate it. We want to try to uh, smooth the waters out just a little bit, you know, and to Micah's point, I can tell you exactly what the market's going to do. It's going to fluctuate up and it's going <laughs> to fluctuate down and it's going to be down the day you want to retire to scare the bejesus out of you. And then, mm -hmm. you know, while you're working, it's just going to keep creeping up. We don't know. No one knows. Uh, anyone that tells you they can, and eh, I mean, chewing too much gummies or something, you know, I, it, it's, it's a part of it. It's not all of it, but it's a masterpiece yes. in this plan that you're going to develop. I love it. Well, Pops, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's My always pleasure. great to have you on yeah. here. Well, until next Take time, care. happy planning. Happy planning.